Welcome back to our lecture series on um, the political history of modern Japan. And uh, I'm very excited for uh, today's talk. I don't, I don't know if you can tell that. I'm actually also quite underslept and it's very early in the morning, but uh, I am actually very excited. Um, and uh, the reason for that is because we're talking about, uh, we're, today we're going to look at a period of history that, uh, for me, uh, as a researcher of modern Japanese history, is very uh, interesting, and I think very important as well because of uh, how it shaped uh, uh, the course of um, uh, uh, Japanese uh, history and post-war history, um, and for many of the other implications and repercussions that it had, uh, which uh, I think we're still in some ways feeling today. And the period that I'm going to talk about today is uh, the time immediately after uh, the end of the Asia-Pacific War, and that is a period of seven years approximately when Japan was occupied by the Allies uh, and especially under the uh, guidance of uh, the United States. Um, and many reforms were instituted uh, in the country at this time. Um, and so I'm going to talk about some of those. And I'll also look at uh, some of the major documents uh, from the, the time period which um, were influential uh, in either a legal or political sense, and which still, uh, many of which are uh, being, uh, which are still applicable uh, today. And I'll examine some of the, uh, I'll examine some quotes of people from the time of prominent uh, public intellectuals, uh, politicians, and uh, diplomats, military persons on uh, both sides, on both um, from the U.S. perspective and also from the Japanese perspective uh, as well, to try to get a sense of how um, uh, prominent persons in society, especially though the elite, um, <clears throat> uh, perceived these changes and how they attempted to uh, use this time period to uh, shape uh, Japan. Uh, in its time of reconstruction, in a way that, uh, in a way that they wanted, in a way that was suitable for them. So this is a little bit uh, elite-centered kind of top-down um, history that we're looking at again here. Uh, not too much of the grassroots level social history stuff today. Um, that is also very interesting, but uh, again, in a in a course on. Uh, political history, uh, and especially in, in kind of just an introductory course like this, um, uh, just out of time concerns, I had to kind of leave that portion out. Um, mainly, I'm going to be drawing from a book uh, by John Dower. It's a very uh, well-known book, uh, Embracing Defeat. Maybe some of you have already heard of this or read this book before. Uh, fantastic work of history. Um, and one of the, the go-to uh, works uh, when examining this period, and, and the book has been translated into Japanese uh, as well. Okay, uh, so let's get started. So I've titled my talk, uh, U.S. Occupation and Post-War Reconstruction, 1945 to 1952. So that just a short time period of about seven years, but uh, a lot of things happened during this time, uh, which still have very important uh, implications uh, for uh, today. So we need to preface the or I want to preface this talk first, um, just in, in a bit of the context of the immediate post-war, um, and especially the costs of the war, and just uh, 
I'm trying to get a grasp of how uh, deadly and costly it was, uh, not just in Japan, of course, but around uh, Asia. Uh, 15 million, it's estimated 15 million Chinese were killed and 3 million Japanese. 9 million Japanese were homeless. 6.5 million stranded abroad. 1.3 million Koreans were left in Japan, stuck in Japan, unable to return right away. Many of them had been brought here uh, for purposes of forced labor, conscripted labor. 150,000 uh, Okinawan civilians had been killed in fighting. 67 major Japanese cities had been bombed to near complete destruction, and the economy was in shambles. So, I mean, this is just scratching the surface, actually, of the costs of war, but, you know, how to pick up, how to rebuild from this. And so a lot of the focus, especially in Japan, is on rebuilding. Fuko, uh, Saiken are some of the words that are being used. Also, um, constructing a new Japan, Shin Nihon, something like this. this. These are all of the ideas and phrases being floated around at the time um, because people were struggling with how to confront this loss and to rebuild from this loss. The Allied occupation lasted uh, six years, eight months, so roughly seven years. Uh, during this time, Japan had no sovereignty, no diplomatic relations, no, and no Japanese could travel abroad until uh, the near the end of the occupation. So it was kind of complete lockdown in a sense. Uh, the U.S. General Headquarters, GHQ, and the Supreme Commander for the Allied Powers, uh, SCAP. This is also used to refer to, this refers to two things, the agency itself, as well as the person who kind of represented the agency or headed the agency, General Douglas MacArthur. Uh, pursued a policy of demilitarization and democratization. Demilitarize the country, get rid of the army and navy completely, reduce Japan's uh, ability to wage war to zero, and then democratize the country. Uh, and I'll talk more about this in particular later. But also, uh, the U.S. aim was to reinvent Japan as a staunch Cold War ally and use Japan as a base for its regional hegemony in the Asia-Pacific. And Dower writes, uh, the losers w wished both to forget the past and to transcend it, um, but that in the process of rebuilding and pursuing Japan's war responsibility in particular, uh, Asians themselves were largely left out of the process, and Asian victims of the war became, in a sense, uh, invisible. So next I want to talk a little bit about U.S. and Japanese aims and justifications for the occupation period. Um, okay, so one place to kind of start the occupation in a sense is actually while the war is still going on uh, with the Potsdam Declaration that the Allied powers in Russia um, issued uh, as kind of an ultimatum to Japan. And this is on July 26, 1945. Um, <clears throat> as I looked at in the past lecture, uh, the Japanese government eventually rejected, um, or initially rejected, uh, the, the Potsdam Declaration, or ignored it, um, and then didn't actually surrender and accept the terms of the Potsdam Declaration until uh, later uh, in August. But I just want to look at a little bit of this because it, it kind of outlines, you know, um, what shape the occupation is going and the post-war is going to uh, take. There must be eliminated for all time the authority and influence of those who have deceived and misled the people of Japan. Okay, so this is important because um, already it's assigning responsibility. Why did Japan fight the war? Who's responsible for the war? Is it the Japanese people themselves? According to the Potsdam Declaration, no, it's not. Uh, and in particular, um, well, and it says the Japanese people have basically been deceived and misled. Well, who deceived and misled the Japanese people then into fighting this mistaken war? as will be shown a little bit later from the perspective of not all of the Allies, but especially some in the U.S., um, it was 
the militarists. Um, and I, I say this in quotes because, you know, who, who exactly is a militarist per se? Well, it was a, a small cabal of especially army leaders that the Allies uh, and the America especially eventually chose to blame uh, for uh, bearing responsibility of the war. But this had important implications for how Japanese people later perceived their war responsibility. And then it talks about building a new order of peace, security, and justice. Um, but a new order, you know, this is interesting. Um, this, I think, kind of hints at a U.S.-led hegemony in the Asia Pacific, but, um, you know, could be interpreted in different ways. And then it talks about uh, the occupation. Until such a new order is established and until there is convincing proof that Japan's war-making power is destroyed, points in Japanese territory will be designated by, to be designated by the Allies shall be occupied. And then to, to secure the achievement of the basic objectives we are uh, here setting forth. So talks about the occupation already. Um, and indeed, Allied planners had already been thinking, you know, long before this, um, about the post-war occupation, right? Because um, even in Japan, people thought there's no way that Japan is going to win a war against Great Britain and the United States. Their, um, their production capacity, for instance, industrial com production capacity is completely, is, is vastly, uh, different from Japan's. It's, it's far greater than Japan's. Um, and so all these material differences, um, were quite clearly pointed to the impossibility that Japan would ever win the war, and, and many Japanese leaders never even expected, uh, you know, a complete or total victory. They just wanted um, to convince uh, the U.S. to let it keep uh, the colonies that it had already taken, and, and to not uh, uh, keep fighting against Japan, right? Well, that didn't happen, of course, but nevertheless, Allied planners as well had already perceived, hey, there's no way Japan can win this war, they were thinking about the occupation from the very beginning. Okay, next, moving on. The terms of the Cairo Declaration shall be carried out, and Japanese sovereignty shall be limited to the islands of Honshu, Hokkaido, Kyushu, and Shikoku. All right, um, so there were previous uh, declarations before this that the Allied powers had uh, issued. I didn't touch on these here because the Potsdam, I felt, is just the most important uh, of those. But... <clears throat> Why is this phrase in particular important? Well, because Japan, as you know, has territorial problems today with its neighbors, right? It has some um, disputes with Russia about what in uh, about the northern territories in Japanese Hopodyodo. Um, you know, who do they belong to? Whose territory are those? Um, this this is part of the problem, okay? And then Okinawa, notice, is nowhere listed in here, right? It's just the four main islands. Okinawa indeed was occupied by uh, America exclusively, the American military, until 1972 when it was released to Japan, but it still contains the majority of uh, American military bases uh, in Japan are all located in Okinawa. Um, the Senkaku Islands, conflict between Japan and China over these. Nowhere are they listed in here. So it left these things uh, completely up in the air. You know, who owns these territories? and it reduced Japan to this territory. But so um, it kind of kicked the can down the road, essentially, like, yeah, figure those problems out later with its neighbors. And some political scholars will argue that the United States purposely uh, did that so that Japan would have a difficulty uh, negotiating with Russia and China especially uh, and would be closer drawn into to, uh, the American sphere of uh, influence. Stern justice shall be meted out to all war criminals, including those who have visited cruelties upon our prisoners. Uh, okay, focusing on Japan's war crimes here, but especially um, crimes against allied prisoners of war. This is very important. The allies are issuing this declaration. They're, um, they're the ones trying Japan in the post-war for war crimes. Um, not people from China or the Philippines um, and, and elsewhere who were the real victims of, uh, uh, Japanese imperialism, right? So those victims in that sense are kind of already being left out of post-war, uh, discussions of war responsibility. 
Um, the Japanese government shall remove all obstacles to the revival and strengthening of democratic tendencies among the Japanese people. Here we are again about democracy, right? Democratization, revival and strengthening of democratic tendencies. But again, you know, loosely defined term. What What is democratic? It, it's kind of hard to say. Um, talking about industry, Japan can maintain such industries as will sustain her economy, and eventually Japan should be recuperated so that it can participate in world trade. Um, economy is very important. I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but it's important to American grand strategy and for its post-war vision of the world of exporting liberal capitalism uh, around around the world um, and and benefiting from trade and 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 having this idea that um, liberal capitalism uh, is somehow can act as a preventative force against future war. If countries are trading with each other, this is a good thing. They're less likely to fight against each other. This is the the standard idea in um, the the thinking of these American planners. Um, obviously, that that if you look at history, that's not the case, but this is what they thought. Uh, the occupying forces of the Allies shall be withdrawn from Japan as soon as these objectives have been accomplished, uh, and as soon as Japan there has been established in accordance with the freely expressed will of the Japanese people, people a peacefully inclined and responsible government. Okay, then, so this is the Allies thinking, right? By the way, before the war ends, this is the Allies thinking, how they envision the post-war taking place. What about in Japan? Well, if we're just talking about very elite views, um, how they perceived um, uh, the end of the war. And one important source in this regard is the Imperial Rescript on Surrender, uh, issued by Emperor Hirohito uh, on August 14th and then broadcast uh, as the Jewel Voice broadcast. It's the first time broadcast over the radio, first time on Oh, sorry, on August 15th, it was actually broadcast. It was issued on August 14th. Um, and this was the first time then that, that most people had heard the voice of Hirohito. And it was very difficult, actually, because of the poor um, you know, recording quality at that time, but also because uh, the emperor spoke uh, in kind of an arcane way to understand what he was saying. But people generally perceived like, oh, okay, we've lost, we're surrendering. Um, but the contents of this are very interesting because um, they show how elites, Hirohito, uh, perceived the end of the war. To strive for the common prosperity and happiness of all nations, as well as the security and well-being of our subjects, is the solemn obligation which has been handed down by our imperial ancestors. So focus on ancestors, right? I mean, this is from the Meiji Constitution. We've received this form of government from our imperial ancestors. We're just carrying on their traditions. It's all a line of continuity etc. So they kind of, from the beginning, uh, reaffirming the, uh, the kokudai, basically, the, um, the, the underlying main idea that underlies the formation of the Japanese nation-state. This is all inherited from our ancestors. We declared war on America and Britain out of our sincere desire to ensure Japan's self-preservation and the stabilization of East Asia. So, second line, already justifying um, the war against American Britain. This is in the surrender, <laughs> accepting the terms of surrender. But, you know, just got to throw that in there, like, right? I mean, why did we fight this war? Was it mistaken? Was it destructive? And, you know, no, not going to touch on that, really. It was basically just our sincere desire to ensure Japan's self-preservation, right? Not a war of aggression, a war of self-preservation. From what? From Western imperialism. This is the same justification that is being used throughout uh, the war, being repeated into the post-war, in the very first document of the post-war, and the stabilization of East Asia. Um, well, many people in East Asia would uh, perceive that a bit differently, I think. Um, then he talks about uh, the gallant fighting of the military and naval forces. Um, you know, hey, you guys did a really great job. Utsukari uh, sama, something like that, but then says the war situation has developed not necessarily to Japan's advantage. Well, that's a rather huge understatement. Uh, Japan, as I showed in the first slide, was completely destroyed, essentially. Then he talks about the A-bomb, okay? The two atomic bombs that 
America dropped on Hiroshima uh, and Nagasaki, killing hundreds of thousands of people and uh, producing generations of uh, individuals, uh, civilians who suffered from the negative effects of radiation poisoning. This basically gave the Japanese leadership, including Hirohito, an excuse to end the war, right? They actually didn't really care about all the lives that were lost. Um, and I know this might sound shocking to some of you, but they really didn't. The leadership did not care. They, they even expected average Japanese people to sacrifice themselves for the nation, right? And many Japanese cities had already been bombed through conventional bombing without a peep from uh, the, le the Japanese leadership, right? Um, but the A-bomb, now this is something new, and this really, this they could hold up and say, look, this is really bad. Now we've got to surrender. Now we just don't have a choice. So it gave them an out, essentially, right? The enemy has begun to deploy a new and most cruel bomb. Um, <clears throat> and then, so now they have an excuse of to surrender, essentially, and the A-bomb allows Japanese leadership to portray this in a way that is positive to them. Consider this line. Such being the case, how are we to save the millions of our subjects? Why are we surrendering? Because if we didn't, you know, many more millions of people would die. That's true. Um, but, I mean, are they really saving the millions of subjects? They could have surrendered well before August 1945. That would have really saved millions of people when they, they, they knew they were going to lose. Um, but uh, nevertheless, you know, Hirohito, here he comes uh, to save millions of people. So the surrender in itself uh, is perceived as, as kind of then a benevolent act on his part. Um, we cannot but express the deepest sense of regret to our allied nations of East Asia who have consistently cooperated with the emperor towards the emancipation of East Asia. Well, <clears throat> this is just more wartime rhetoric justifying the greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere. <clears throat> and again, it's very questionable whether people in Asia, East Asia uh, would have actually uh, agreed with this statement. Probably not. <clears throat> okay, then, now let's move forward a little bit more. And again, just looking from this looking at this from the perspective of uh, official documents, uh, now we get into more actual planning documents from uh, SCAP, from GHQ, right? And these kind of laid out a plan in more specific terms for uh, how to carry out the occupation. <clears throat> so most of these come from U.S. initial post-surrender policy for Japan, um, but there are, there's another one as well, a conference between Prime Minister Shidehara and General uh, MacArthur as well. The Japanese people shall be encouraged to develop a desire for individual liberties and respect for fundamental human rights. Shall be encouraged. Um, pretty top-down, right? I mean, um, can't they develop these things themselves? Um, hmm, questionable from this statement, right? They shall be encouraged. You know, they need encouragement to develop these things, I guess. So we see kind of... So, quite a bit of paternalistic, top-down thinking um, in SCAP documents from the time. The Supreme Commander will exercise his authority through Japanese governmental machinery and agencies, including the Emperor. Uh, okay, this is important. Um, what do we learn from this? Well, they're going to keep the Emperor, okay? They're going to keep the Emperor, and they're going to work through him to carry out... Uh, American occupation policies. This is, this is a very important uh, statement, and we'll talk about this more later. Uh, get rid of old restrictive... Okay, and then this is not a direct quote, but in summarizing the conference uh, notes between Shidehara and MacArthur, here's what MacArthur was asking for. Get rid of old restrictive systems. He compared this to liberating people from slavery, so saw the American occupation occupiers coming in, liberating the Japanese people from bondage, um, something like this. MacArthur loved to use these biblical terms from the Old Testament of, like, you know, Americans are basically like God's chosen people just coming to, 
to save people. It's really um, kind of this, uh, um, uh, uh, what would you call it, uh, manifest destiny, right, kind of thinking as well. Um, and then again, uh, the strengthening of democratic tendencies, we see this again and again, the strengthening of liberal political tendencies, okay, well, liberalism, this is a bit more specific, this is an, this is an ism, you know, this is a, a, an ideology, in contrast to other ideologies, and then modifying the feudal and authoritarian tendencies of the government. Um, okay, so this gets a little bit complex here, I don't want to totally go too deep into into this, this is probably a, something for another talk, but basically many American leaders at the time held on to an idea known as modernization theory. And this posited that uh, Western liberal capitalism was the apogee of society, of world society. I mean, in terms of government, politics, economics, Western-led liberal capitalism that's the that's as good as it gets. This is what people thought. Okay, some Western leaders thought this, and then everything else, all of history, is just a straight line of progression toward that point. So, um, people would have to go. Societies would have to go through feudalism, for instance, before they could graduate into liberal capitalism. And this is what modernization theory taught. And academics at this time thought this. Um, American political leaders and military leaders definitely thought this. So they saw Japan as not fully uh, modernized, basically. They saw Japan as backwards, as feudal, as not developed. And this is why, for some American leaders, this is why Japan got into the war in the first place, because it was feudal, it was authoritarian. Well, obviously, this justifies, at the same time, as acting as a critique, it justifies American ideology. It justifies the ideology of liberal capitalism. Like, yeah, it's so great, right? I mean, everyone else is feudal and backwards. We need to lead these people, right? This is what, seriously, American political leaders thought, okay? So this is, this is why this is kind of important. Very paternalistic, anyway. Um, well, what did some public intellectuals in Japan think? I want to just highlight an example of a very prominent public intellectual, Tokyo University President Nambara Shigeru. Um, he had been a prominent public intellectual throughout the war, writing many statements in support of the war and utilizing liberalism in support of the war. Um, now this is issued in a speech to Tokyo University students uh, in September 1945, after the war had ended, and it outlines his vision of a reconstructed Japan in the post-war. It's quite interesting. Let's take a look. First, he talks about resurrecting the homeland, making it once more glorious. Um, it used to be glorious during the war, and eh, not so glorious. Let's make it glorious again, kind of, kind of like this. Um, make, kind of like make Japan great again, right? Um, how do we do that? Well, he thought we need Japan needs to develop a new consciousness of our kokutai. This is the relationship again between gods, emperor, and subjects. Okay. Um, and then he talks about why did, um, how did things get this way in the first place? I think he's talking about the end of the war. How did Japan lose the war? And then he says, it's because we weren't sincere in serving the state. Wow. Well, okay. Um, that's quite interesting. That's a very, very elite, uh, view of things. Um, if only those average people had fought a little bit harder, then, uh, then we, may, we might have won, right? I mean, this is what he's saying, okay? Um, then he talks about the new form of this koktai that he envisions, and it said it would slough off the shell of racial and religious divinity unique to our country and gain a humanistic, universal, rational foundation comprehensible to the entire world. Okay, well, you know, that sounds all right. There must be a reconsideration of Japanese things and a recognition of the true Japanese spirit. So, He's framing this, again, in very nationalistic, very um, almost kind of racialistic thinking, in a way. Um, there's a thing called the Japanese people, right? They're all held together by some kind of common, not probably not just nationhood, but, but um, you know, uh, racial identity of, like, as a minzoku, right? Um, 
and that there's then within that there exists some kind of a, a common shared Japanese spirit um, that is true to things and and that we he thinks we need that Japanese people needed to reclaim this and it it, it lay somewhere in what he thought was like a third path okay um, a third path um, uh, and for him this was not to repeat the mistakes of what he says were rampant liberalism and Marxism. So he's looking for a third path that doesn't go down either of those roads. This is really interesting because neither rampant liberalism nor Marxism got Japan into World War II in the first place. Uh, militarism, yes, maybe. Uh, well, definitely. But, um, or, you know, kind of... Uh, um, you know, very undemocratic forms of government, uh, the emperor system, things like these. These definitely <laughs> got Japan into World War II. But not having, it, you know, too much liberalism or Marxism. I mean, Marxism was completely suppressed during the war. Um, so there's no way it could have gotten Japan in any trouble. But um, nevertheless, this is what uh, Nambarashigiri felt. Nambarashigiri, again, is an important liberal, but you know, not too liberal, I guess. Um, Thus, we must maintain the particularities of Japanese culture. Uh, we will exalt the sacred words of the imperial rescript on education. Wow. Okay, so, I mean, here, this is, the imperial rescript on education is describing the old form of the Kokutai, but he wants to exalt this, these sacred words, he's saying. And then the, the point is to um, bring about a true state of might to make Japan strong again. So, very nationalistic, very nation-centered, Japan-centered, um, and, you know, kind of really missing the point of why Japan got into the war. But, again, elites like Nambarashigiru, public intellectuals, this is how many of them perceived uh, the war. Okay, let's look at some of the strategies and reforms that uh, the Japanese government and the U.S. occupation took. Uh, first, um, one of the big things was, of course, dissolving the military, uh, demilitarization, right? This is a big thing. Um, get them to step down first because, you know, in a state of war, uh, you want to make sure that your enemy is disarmed first before you waltz into uh, the country. This was very tense. It was not an easy thing. Um, lots of tense situations. People didn't, not everyone surrendered immediately. Um, some Some people in... You know, some uh, military personnel um, didn't know that the war had ended uh, right away when they were, you know, out abroad somewhere, you know, out in the battlefield and far away from, um, uh, uh, you know, the mainland, right? So um, this this was an important thing. Um, break up the Zybots of these big corporate conglomerates of private companies, I mean, basically monopolies, essentially, right, who held all different kinds of industries, transportation networks, banking, all these things under the same, um, you know, board of uh, directors. Uh, the anti-monopoly law, so, was an important part of this, enacted in 1947. Also, agricultural land reform. Now landlords can own only about one hectare of land, and absentee landlords, their land was sold to the tenants. So this is, this is big. This had actually already been underway, in, in a way, during the war, in fact, because Japan needed to um, up its agricultural production to fight the war, and giving power to uh, individual farmers was a part of that. But um, SCAP came in and, and pushed that further. Uh, Union labor laws at first uh, allow, you know, unions, labor unions to form. Uh, and the unionization rate and the number of disputes dramatically rose after that. Uh, around probably 50% of workers, I think, were unionized uh, during their period from 1948 to 1949. Um, however, unions were still organized around companies rather than trade. So they're internal unions generally within the company. Um, and this, this is an important uh, facet of how unions would negotiate uh, with companies because, in a sense, they both had um, shared interests uh, for the success of the company, right? Um, 
abolish state Shinto, Kokka Shinto. Um, Kokka Shinto, I don't have time to fully explain uh, what this was in, in a short talk right here, but um, basically, um, I mean, Shinto, in a sense, it, it's a key part of the foundation of the Meiji state, and uh, it underlies um, emperor ideology of the emperor being at the center of this worldview, his, himself as a divine figure being descended from the gods, uh, and then pr presiding over um, this, uh, you know, um, his, his earthly subjects. Um, and then it was also very interlinked into the state as well, who, who operated, um, you know, uh, key uh, national shrines at the top of this hierarchy um, and incorporated uh, local shrines into this. So this was all new, actually, from the Meiji period. So Kokka Shinto, I mean, is this really even a thing anyway? I, I mean, in a way, part of this was all inherent from the, the type of Shinto that was constructed from the Meiji period anyway. But American leaders really wanted to emphasize that there's this thing called Kokka Shinto. Um, and the reason for that was, as I'll talk about uh, in later slides, was because they wanted to keep the emperor, portray him as good. Uh, they didn't even deny his divinity. Um, but rather, they just wanted to get rid of what they saw as the militaristic aspects of Shintoism. And they saw this as a perversion of Shinto beliefs. Um, and at the same time, they also wanted to um, genuinely and earnestly wanted to separate church and state, Seikyo Bunni, um, by removing public support for Shinto shrines and ceremonies. Um, this was actually um, quite successful, I think, and, and even though it's violated in many ways today, um, it, it, at first this was, was quite successful and in many ways continues to hold. Um, but then, as I said, keep the emperor and work through him to implement their reforms, uh, establish a new alliance between the U.S. and Japan. In 1947, a new constitution was promulgated, and then in 1948, a lot of the reforms and the policies that SCAP was taking uh, kind of took a rightward shift, and this is called the reverse course. In the context of the Korean and Cold War, um, Japan began to supply arms. Uh, Japanese heavy industry companies began to manufacture arms uh, for America to wage its uh, wage its war against uh, North Korea and China and uh, the USSR, uh, and of course also provide military bases uh, as a springboard for American planes and military to uh, launch their military strikes. Um, but along with this crackdown on labor, uh, Red Purge. So crackdown on labor here, withdraw the right to strike. 1949, a red purge of suspected leftists from schools, uh, teachers, um, and other public offices, and banning the publication of the Japanese Communist Party's uh, Akahata newspaper. Um, you know, many of these um, bear strong similarity to actions taken um, in wartime Japan, in fact. Uh, Okay, and then reforming the emperor. So now I'm going to spend a little bit of time then talking about this because this is really important how uh, America used the emperor, essentially, the institution of the emperor, uh, to implement its reforms and, um, and to gain the support of people in Japan. Um, okay, they use the... the the emperor to carry out the reforms, and some people have argued, some Japanese political scientists have argued that this bond between America and Japan, through the person of the emperor, became the new post-war Kokutai. Now, not everyone agrees with this, um, but some Japanese political scientists have argued this, and I find this to be a very con uh, convincing argument, actually. Uh, they tried to insert themselves into the Kokutai relationship, basically. Uh, 
so that now the Kokutai became basically predicated on the tenets of liberal democracy. It was based on a symbol emperor, Shoucho Tenno, and at the same time, keeping the emperor aids the conservative view in Japan amongst Japanese elites. It pleases them because it allows them to maintain the idea that Japan never really lost the war in the first place. Well, hey, we kept the most important thing that we were pursuing. We kept the Kokutai, right? Because that's all they really wanted to do. They wanted to preserve the Kokutai eventually. And if the emperor himself is seen as per personifying the Kokutai, well then, they actually won. They, they achieved that aim. Um, the meaning of the Kokutai and who was, uh, and the contents of that were always, Ill, you know, kind of vaguely defined. So America was able to kind of latch on to that and um, kind of fill that with its own um, ideologies as well. The, and to support this, then, the U.S. invented the narrative that Japanese leaders and the emperor himself had been duped, deceived, as we saw in the Potsdam Declaration, by gangster militarists. Um, so this uh, group of renegade militarists... Um, deceived the, the emperor and the Japanese people, and that's why Japan fought the war, right? You can see what effects this will have for shaping Japanese perception of their wartime responsibility, which basically the U.S. is saying at this time they have none, um, because they were all deceived, uh, which of course is not true. Um, as we talked about in the last lecture, uh, the February 26th incident, incident for, for instance, an, an actual military coup failed. It was shot down by the emperor himself. Um, so there never was a military overthrow in Japan. The Diet continued to operate throughout the war. So there's no way that the emperor was duped by gangster militarists. Um, but the U.S. invented this narrative so that they could purge the emperor of his responsibility. And the task was to... Uh, what Dower calls uh, drive a wedge between the emperor uh, and his subjects on the one hand and the militarists on the other. Um, also, the, as I mentioned, America attempted to position itself into this post-war Kokutai relationship. So you could perceive this in this way. The previous relationship was the gods, Amaterasu, followed by the emperor, followed by his subjects, and then his colonial subjects at the end. Well, Japan loses its colonies at the end of the war, so this is cut off. So now we just have this, these three. Um, subjects are transformed into citizens, kokumin. And then here comes America. And where does America fit into this? Well, you could argue that it's in front of the gods, practically. And now the gods are just in parentheses, because it's ambiguous whether the emperor is actually a divine figure or not. Um, these efforts, as, as John Dower talks about, were led by, especially by General, uh, U.S. General Bonner Fellers uh, form, and former Ambassador Joseph Grew, etc., and were supported by Japanese conservative elites, such as former Foreign Minister Shigemitsu Mamoru. Uh, and the position of and thinking about the emperor were partly outlined in the January 1946 Humanity Declaration, Ningen Sengen. This is where the emperor got on the radio again. Um, he said, hey everyone, happy new year. Um, I may or may not be a god, basically, is what he says, right? And that's why it's called the Mianity Declaration. He also made some other more important points in that document, but let's, let's have a look. Oh, first of all, these are American leaders that I mentioned, Joseph Grew and Bonner Fellers, and I'll get to the Humanity Declaration uh, in a, uh, the next slide. Joseph Grew said in 1943... The Japanese rank and file are somewhat like sheep and malleable under the impact of new circumstances and new conditions. Very elitist. Very paternalistic. <laughs> Just so long as militarism is rampant in that land, Shintoism will be used by the military leaders by appealing to the emotionalism and the superstition of the people to stress the virtues of militarism and of war through emphasis on the worship of the spirits of former military heroes. When militarism goes, that emphasis will likewise disappear. Shintoism involves emperor homage too, and once Japan is under the aegis of a peace-seeking ruler not controlled by the military, that phase of Shintoism can become an asset, not a liability in a reconstructed nation. Shintoism, the emperor, 
not all bad. Could be an asset. Could be an important asset. 1943, people are arguing this in the U.S., right? Bonnerfellers in 1944 stated, To the masses will come the realization that the gangster militarists have betrayed their sacred emperor. Just what I was talking about here, right? They have led the Son of Heaven, divine ruler of the emperor, to the very precipice of destruction. Those who deceive the emperor cannot e exist in Japan. There must be no weakness in the peace terms. However, to dethrone or hang the emperor would cause a tremendous and violent reaction from all Japanese. Hanging of the emperor to them would be comparable to the crucifixion of Christ to us. America must lead, not follow events. At the proper time, we should permit the, uh, the driving of a wedge between the emperor and, and the people on the one hand, and the Tokyo gangster militarists on the other. Uh, I don't know why he inserted Tokyo here. They're all congregated in Tokyo or something. It's kind of funny. Uh, years of bloodbaths may be possibly be avoided if we understand clearly our enemy and handle him intelligently. After Japan is totally defeated, American justice might, must be the way and light. The emperor can be made a force for good and peace provided. Japan is totally defeated and the military clique destroyed. This is the basic attitude that the U.S. occupation adopted toward the emperor and toward Japan. Um, a lot of people wanted to pursue the emperor's responsibility more fully. I mean, after all, he did personally declare war uh, through imperial rescript and command against Great Britain and the United States, for instance. Um, so it, his responsibility seemed fairly obvious. Uh, in fact, it would be harder to argue that he didn't have any responsibility. And that's what American leaders are trying to do, exactly. Um, but anyway, uh, this, is, this is just uh, a quote from him. Um, continuing on, so I mentioned Foreign Minister Shigemitsu uh, Mamoru. Um, and this is Dower writing about his, his view, so it's not a direct quote. But Dower writes, The demands in the Potsdam Declaration were flexible, uh, Shigemitsu assured the emperor, and contained nothing that would hinder Japan's reconstruction. The mistakes of the recent past had occurred because the identity between the emperor's heart and the people's heart had been lost after the Meiji period, when the military succeeded in inserting itself between the sovereign and his subjects. The true spirit of Japan, essentially democratic, included respect for fundamental human rights, as well as freedom of thought, religion, and expression. The democracy demanded by the Potsdam Declaration would be realized when the emperor's thoughts and his subjects' wishes were once again unified. The emperor should commit itself to democratic reforms with a zeal double that of the early Meiji period. This is Shigemitsu Mamoru's thinking, uh, so Japanese elite politician views at this time, and Shigemitsu Mamoru also said, hey, yeah, we can surrender to the Allies. They're going to protect the Kokutai. They're going to protect you, the Emperor. Uh, it's not a big deal. You know, we've, we've got what we want, basically. And in fact, we're just restoring this relationship that was lost between you and your subjects when these bad military people suddenly came in. And I don't even know why they came in. They just did. They came in. They, you know, caused all this trouble. But now we're going to get rid of them. And we're going to go back to the Great Meiji period. Um when things were really democratic. Well, as we've seen also, by the way, it's a complete illusion that things were better in the Meiji period. I mean, the what I'm trying to emphasize through these lectures is the reason that Japan went on the road to war from the first place, in the first place, was because of fundamentally undemocratic structures that were embedded in the nature of the Meiji state. People didn't have political rights. They didn't have freedoms of expression and all these things that we take for granted today um, that may have prevented uh, Japan from going to war. None of that existed in the Meiji period. The Meiji Constitution, as we examined, is a totally undemocratic document that says that the emperor is a god. Um, but this is what these Japanese elites are saying was so great. You know, we got to get back to that. <laughs> so, um, I mean, there's a huge inconsistency here. <clears throat> Fellers again says uh, that in the interest of peaceful occupation and rehabilitation of Japan, prevention of revolution and communism, all facts surrounding the execution of the declaration of war and subsequent, subsequent position of the emperor, uh, which tend to show fraud, menace, or duress, uh, be marshaled. 
Actually, I don't really know what this quote is saying, and I'm not sure why I included it in this uh, PowerPoint, but I'll just skip over that. Okay. Um, let's go to the January 1946 Humanity Declaration, Ningen Sengen. This was actually drafted, or kind of partly drafted for the emperor by people like Reginald Blythe, a UK Japanologist, and Harold Henderson, a, UK, a US Japanologist. Um, so already working very much through the person of the emperor to implement uh, allied reforms. Uh, Dower talk goes into more detail on this, um, but I'll, I'll skip over some of the, of the particulars. Um, but basically what's in the document is um, this idea that in the past, Japanese had shown loyalty to the emperor and the nation, and that now they should use this bond to show loyalty to the new world order. And the new world order, of course, led by America. And um, also through the person of the emperor, right? So this is, this is why this idea was important. Uh, and then royalists, um, Japanese elites close to the emperor, added a section about confusion of thought, shiso konnan, to indicate a critique of socialism and communism and their support of liberal democracy. But Dower also points out that in their praising of the Meiji state, this overlooked or denied the imperialistic, the fundamentally imperialistic nature of the Meiji state, as I also just talked about. And Dower writes, the emperor was willing to deny that he had ever been a god in the Western sense, or even in the more ambiguous Japanese sense, but he was unwilling to deny that he was a descendant of the sun goddess, as the ancient 8th century mytho histories had set forth, as the Meiji emperor's own constitution and proclaim, as the entire cycle of rituals he performed as a Shinto priest had indicated, and as 20th century ideologues had reiterated ad nauseum. So, this is important, right? In the Humanity Declaration, he says, okay, yeah, you know, I'm probably not a god. But he didn't, never said that he was not descended from gods. So he kept that part in implicitly, okay? And also the word used for divine in the document, Akitsu Mikami, uh, which is manifest deity, emphasizes that idea that well, he personally is not a living god, but he is descended, or he may be descended from gods. This is the implication in this document. So very, very well-crafted, uh, strategically crafted uh, document. Here are just uh, some sections. In greeting the new year, we recall to mind that Emperor Meiji proclaimed as the basis of our national policy, the five clauses of the Charter Oath at the beginning of the Meiji era. We wish to make this oath anew and restore the country to stand on its own feet again. So praising the Meiji era and praising the Charter Oath, which is the very first document that we looked at in this class. And if you'll remember in the Charter Oath, in the fifth clause of the Charter Oath, it said, why does Japan pursue knowledge throughout the world? Well, the purpose is to strengthen the imperial institution to strengthen the foundation of the imperial nation state. So very specifically places the emperor at the center of national life. And this is what the emperor is saying, like, yeah, we got to go back to this great thing. It was so awesome. Um, love of the family and love of the country are especially strong in this country. With more of this devotion, should we now work toward love of mankind? Okay. The ties between us and our people have always stood upon mutual trust and affection. They do not depend on mere legends and myths. They are not predicated on the false conception that the emperor is divine. Okay, this is Akitsumi coming, right? So he's not a living god himself, but no denial here that he's descended from the gods. And that the Japanese people are superior to other races and fated to rule the world. So this is this document. If you click on this link here, I guess you probably can't do that actually because this is a YouTube video, but if you look online, you can find this document in uh, English and Japanese uh, kind of side-by-side -side translations, very nice. Okay, let's look at another important reform and document um, that became one of the key documents of Japanese political and legal uh, uh, thinking in the post-war, and of course continues to be uh, 
can, it, it continues to be used today. This is still the basis for um, the highest kind of law of the land in Japan today, the post-war constitution. So MacArthur, in a way, kind of took charge. Um, <clears throat> now, there were Japanese scholars and politicians as well uh, working on drafts of the constitution. I'll touch on this a little bit later. Uh, but again, Japan is under foreign occupation at this time, military occupation. Every decision has to be basically approved by the occupation. And the highest figure in that is General Douglas MacArthur. And he comes in and he says, look, I'm not going to write the whole constitution, but I got three points and you, you, you have to put them in there. Okay. And these were his three points. <clears throat> the emperor is at the head of state. War as a sovereign right of the nation is abolished. The feudal system of Japan will cease. Okay, well, emperor is head of state, clear enough. We see this actually reflected in the post-war constitution. This is the very first um, chapter. Same with the Meiji constitution, by the way, very first chapter. Takes a little bit different perspective on the emperor, true, but, you know, first chapter. Uh, war as a sovereign right of the nation is abolished. Uh, I'll get into this more later, but this is going to be an important point uh, for throughout post-war politics in Japan. And then the feudal system of Japan will cease. I already talked about this idea of feudal system. I mean, what, what is feudal system? He's talking about Hoken Seido in Japanese, right? But, I mean, what, what particularly is feudal? It's a very loosely defined word, and as I mentioned in the context, context of modernization theory, it just justifies... Um, U.S.-led liberal capitalism. Uh, the background to the writing of the Constitution, uh, again, the U.S. aimed to protect the emperor system. Why? Because it represented a new post-war Kokutai based on the U.S.-Japan alliance. Um, and then at the same time, there were, as I mentioned, Japanese politicians and, and uh, political parties were also writing their own draft constitutions. Okay, this is kind of dangerous from the perspective of the GHQ. They don't, they don't want to take too radical of a stance, right? And for instance, in November 1945, Communist Party draft of the Constitution, of their idea of the Constitution, said that popular sovereignty lies with the people. Now, actually, in most other democracies in the world, this would be a, a, an idea taken for granted. Of course, popular sovereignty lies with the people, but... Not in Japan, lies with the Ember. <clears throat> so this is why that was dangerous to the GHQ. Shuken wa jimmin ni ari, they said. What this really meant was an elimination of the Emperor system. Ooh, dangerous stuff. Can't have that, right? Because U.S. needs the Emperor to enact their reforms. Uh, so, of course, they shot this down, and this is why, again, the U.S. took, took charge, especially in really pumping out this constitution uh, ASAP. The Far East Commission, um, which was also, you know, part of this is the the actual kind of allied um, organization of allied nations overseeing the occupation. In fact, in reality, um, the U.S. had the most power over the occupation. But in in uh, in theory, and it, it was it, the Far East Commission was overseeing this. Um, included the USSR as a member. And the USSR favored the elimination of the emperor system. So, again, dangerous to U.S. goals. So the U.S. began to draft a constitution in 1946, promulgated it in November, and enacted the following year in May 1947. Here are some sections from the constitution. Um, I'll try to go over this as quickly as possible, but chapter 1, article 1, the emperor shall be the symbol of the state and of the unity of the people. Uh, chapter 1, Article 4, the emperor shall perform only such acts of manner stated or provided in this constitution. Um, chapter 2, Article 9. This is very important and definitely will come up in later lectures. Aspiring sincerely to an international peace based on justice and order, the Japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation and the threat or use of force as means of settling international disputes. In order to accomplish the aim of the preceding paragraph, land, sea, and air forces, as well as other war potential, will never be maintained. The right of belligerency of the state will not be recognized. I have to point out right away, this does not mention self-defense. Uh, it just says war. Uh, 
as a sovereign right of the nation. And the threat or use of force as a means of setting international peace does not talk about self-defense. Okay, so that's important point that will be much debated uh, in later uh, uh, progression of Japanese uh, post-war history. Um, people have fundamental human rights. People should be respected as individuals. Uh, pe all people are created equal under the law. So, I mean, you know, some of this is it, it's quite a progressive document, I guess. Like, you know, all, includes all the basic tenets of liberal democracy, in, in essence. Freedom of thought, conscious religion, um, right to main... Oh, this is interesting, and I like this. This is often picked up on to... Um, argue in favor of uh, more social support for people and 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 whoa what's going on here sorry my powerpoint is freaking out okay and um calls to reduce in, uh, inequality all people shall have the right to maintain the minimum standards of wholesome and cultured living in all spheres of life the state shall use its endeavors for the promotion and extension of social welfare and security and of public health the right to maintain the minimum standards of wholesome and cultured living. I, I gotta say, this is a great passage. Um, I mean, because this could include, um, you know, the right to um, have a house, to have a job, uh, to have food, uh, to have clothing, to have all these things. And people have the right to these things. Everybody. Um so this is this could be read as a radical call to reduce uh, inequality. Right to education. Uh, then going on, gosh, the, the diet shall be the highest organ of the state of power. The diet shall consist of two houses: the House of Representatives and the House of Counselors. This is new, right? Um, House of Counselors is new. Only used to be the House of Representatives in the Meiji Constitution. Uh, both houses shall consist of elected members, representative of all the people. Uh, executive power shall be vested in the cabinet. The cabinet shall consist of the prime minister, who shall be its head, and ministers of state. Uh, ministers of state and prime minister must be civilians. <coughs> um, yeah. Okay. That's basically good, I guess. Um, then... When the Constitution was promulgated, the Emperor gave a, an interesting speech, so just kind of want to look at this as well, but whereas we make it the joy and glory of our heart to behold the prosperity of our country and the welfare of our subjects, we do hereby, in virtue of the supreme power we inherit from our imperial ancestors, promulgate the present immutable fundamental law for the sake of our present subjects and their descendants. Uh, I mean, you know, maybe this is just a lot of rhetoric, like, it's just kind of um, you know, hackneyed phrases that, like, people have to use. I don't know, but, I mean, this could have been issued at literally any time in Japanese modern history. Um, it, it sounds exactly like how things in the Meiji uh, period were proclaimed. Um, Everything is inherited from our imperial ancestors. Again, idea of the family state, the emperor at the head, uh, subjects as children. It even uses the word subjects even though this constitution is proclaiming people as uh, citizens, not subjects. Um, and it goes on basically to describe the Koktai relationship and the idea of the family state, um, et cetera, et cetera. But this is 1947, uh, after the war, right? So, you know, kind of seeing a lot of continuity here and at least elite views regarding the emperor and of his own views regarding himself. Uh, but the Constitution was debated in the Diet, of course, um, especially over the issue of self-defense. Matsumoto Joji and others argued that Article 9 allowed self-defense. Interestingly, Japanese conservatives with the Liberal Party, the later uh, Liberal Democratic Party, uh, such as Yoshida Shigeru, argued against the idea of self-defense. Um, and Yoshida Shigeru made an important point that the whole Asia-Pacific War had been fought in the name of self-defense. Uh, as we already saw in the Emperor's um, surrender speech, Japan was fighting this war, he said, uh, to defend itself from Western imperialism. So this is a great point that... What is going on? Oh, man. <laughs> Sorry, my computer is freaking out. Okay. Uh, this is a great point that 
Yoshida Shigane makes, actually. I mean, he's a conservative right-wing, you know, fairly right-wing guy. Um, but interestingly, he, he is arguing against self-defense. Um, then, paradoxically, this is something that you really don't see very often today, um, the Japanese left actually argued in favor of Japan having a military. Um, and the JCP uh, leader Nosaka Sanzo argued that all nations have the right to self-defense and that there were just and unjust wars. Uh, the JCP, I, I do not believe, I mean, would take such a stance today. Um, Ashida Hitoshi and others revised the wording to allow the possibility of future self-defense. It's not war potential, uh, with the um, with the aim of fighting uh, aggressive war, so therefore self defense is okay. Um, and then looking a little bit more deeply at Japan's post war defense policy, um, we have to perceive this and especially the reverse course, then the remilitarization of Japan in the context of um, U.S. hegemony in the Asia Pacific and the Cold War, um, People's Republic of China in 1949, the USSR. Uh, 1949 tested nuclear weapons. The Korean War began in 1950. And the U.S. saw Japan as a bastion of liberal democracy against communism in Asia. So its rearmament was, in fact, necessary, in spite of the fact that the same American occupiers had just basically written Article 9 into the Constitution. They did not see this as contradicting Japan's remilitarization. And rearmament. Um, conservatives, as I mentioned, like Yoshida Shigeru, were wary of this. They wanted to grow the, the economy under U.S. protection, under U.S. military protection. Um, eventually, as Japanese leaders would later very quickly realize, um, actually having a huge military budget is, for some people, a great way to uh, kind of grow, quote, the economy. Um, Eventually, Japan developed a national police reserve under U.S. guidance, uh, and this later then developed into uh, the self-defense forces. But note that this was a way for the U.S. to offset its costs of police, offset the costs of policing Japan, so that it could focus on fighting uh, the Korean War and the Cold War, and later its larger uh, hegemony in the Asia, Asia Pacific. And this, um, the military bond between Japan and the U.S. was uh, solidified in the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty, signed in 1951, enacted in 1952, um, while at the same time, Article 9 of the Constitution became a key part of Japan's post-war identity, and today it's supported by many liberals, progressives, and much of the public. Okay, I want to kind of go off on a bit of a tangent here, and this will be the last part of my talk, but... I want to position uh, the U.S. occupation and its policies in general in the context of U.S. history and U.S. grand strategy. And this is something that is not often done uh, in historical studies of Japan. And I think that is a shame because um, it's kind of hard to understand why the U.S. took some of the policies it did if we don't perceive these things from the perspective of its larger history and grand strategy. What is the U.S. Uh, grand strategy? Um, well, it's basically something called open door. Open door means spreading liberal capitalism throughout the world, um, as well as U.S. economic hegemony backed up by U.S. military might. Okay, just understanding this actually goes a long way toward understanding the U.S.'s relationship to Japan in the post-war. Why does it have military bases in Japan? What is it really interested in? It's interested in protecting its economic um, hegemony. The U.S. adopted this policy of open door in response to European colonialism in Asia. The U.S. wanted to profit from markets and resources in Asia and Africa, but Europe, European nations, uh, Great Britain, France, the Netherlands, and Germany had basically already started dividing everything up for themselves. The U.S. was a latecomer to colonialism, and uh, it wanted a piece of the action, basically. But it didn't want to fight a war against these countries, so it protested on the basis of protecting markets and free trade so that the U.S. could benefit too. This was first explicitly outlined by U.S. Secretary of State John Hay in 1899, protesting the German sphere of influence in China and requesting free access to Chinese ports, no special tariff exemptions for, uh, for all nations. This is known as uh, 
the Open Door Note. Uh, the U.S. first implemented Open Door in Japan and the Ryukyus through Matthew Perry, U.S. Commoner Matthew Perry, who I mentioned in the first lecture. But America's vision for the world, i.e. global hegemony, liberal capitalism led by the U.S., was not fully achieved until after World War II. This was mainly done through a Lend Loan program to Europe, the Marshall Plan, and institutions such as the Bretton Woods, um, in which the uh, trading in the U.S. dollar became uh, the basis for the world economy. Uh, in Japan, there was the Dodge Line, which was a free market fiscal austerity combined with recycling surplus, surplus funds back to the private sector. This was done through the Bank of Japan, which bought back government securities and bonds held by private banks to increase their money for relending to the private sector. Uh, J America also helped rebuild Japan's heavy industry and arms industry during the 1950 Korean War through special procurements, i.e. the U.S. military paid dollars for arms supplies manufactured in Japan. This greatly boosted Japanese exports and added an influx of foreign currency. So what do we see here, basically? Protecting U.S. economic interests supported by U.S. military might. That's what this is intended to show, basically. And we need to interpret the U.S. occupation of Japan in this context. I just want to go over very quickly some of um, quotes from important people in Japanese history that uh, illustrate this. Commodore Matthew Perry himself wrote to Washington in 1854, it is self-evident that the course of coming events will ere long make it necessary for the United States to extend its territorial jurisdiction beyond the limits of the Western continent, and I assume the responsibility of urging the expediency of establishing a foothold in this quarter of the globe as a measure of positive necessity to the sustainment of our maritime rights in the East. What is Perry talking about here on his visit to the Ryukyu Kingdom? Well, he's basically calling... Uh, for the U.S. to establish a military base in Okinawa and Japan. And why is he doing that? To uh, sustain our maritime rights in the East. Trade, economic interests. Military might protecting economic interests. This is open door. This is the policy that the U.S. Uh, has taken throughout its modern history. And this is the perspective, basically, that we can interpret the U.S. Uh, occupation of Japan from. Um, this was illustrated... For instance, moving on to the occupation in documents, key planning documents from the National Security Council in the United States, issued in 1948, for instance, NSC 13-2 said of economic recovery that it was second only to U.S. security interests, economic recovery should be made the primary objective of United States policy in Japan for the coming period. Right? So very clearly stating, why are we doing this? Why are we occupying Japan? Why are we having military bases here? It's all about money. It's all about economics. Um, another important document in the Cold War uh, was NSC 68 in 1950. I won't read all of this, but basically uh, it outlined a uh, global conflict between two superpowers, the United States and the USSR, uh, and that the, uh, it called for the United States to emerge victorious in this conflict um, through U.S. Uh, military might and a system of military bases established all around the world, uh, and uh, basically U.S. hegemony. <clears throat> we must make ourselves strong both in the way in which we affirm our values and in the conduct of our national life and in the development of our military and economic strength. Um, <clears throat> in a shrinking world which now faces the threat of atomic war is not an adequate objective merely to seek uh, to check the Kremlin design, for the absence of order among nations is becoming less and less tolerable. This fact imposes on us, in our own interests, the responsibility of world leadership. 1950, right? This is the U.S. goal, okay? This is why it's in Japan. This is why it stays in Japan, uh, even after Japan regains its sovereignty in 1952. Um, the overall policy at the present time may be described as one designed to foster a world environment in which the American system can survive and flourish. So, is, J is America really concerned about Japan um, and its recovery? Well, yes, but only to the extent that it supports the American system. Um, okay, and then here, a uh, more rapid buildup of political, economic, and military strength, and thereby of confidence in the free world, 
uh, that is now contemplated is the only course which is consistent with progress toward achieving our fundamental purpose. Um, blah, blah, blah. Okay, something like this. So it's basically calling again for the U.S. to be a world leader. Okay, in this context, then, uh, the United States and Japan signed the Bilateral Security Treaty between the United States of America and Japan, the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty, which is still in effect today, and it's the basis for U.S. Uh, troops in Japan. Um, and it says, uh, in part, uh, uh, there is danger to Japan in this situation because irresponsible militarism has not yet been driven from the world. Therefore, Japan desires a security treaty with the United States of America to come into force simultaneously with the uh, Treaty of Peace between the United States of America and Japan. The Treaty of Peace recognizes that Japan, as a sovereign nation, has the right to enter into collective security arrangements. And further, the Charter of the United Nations recognizes that all nations possess an inherent right of individual and collective self-defense. In 2015, uh, Prime Minister Abe Shinzo sparked a uh, huge controversy and many protests when he tried to um, revise the law basically to allow for collective self-defense, which was, uh, as Japanese constitutional scholars interpreted it, uh, unconstitutional. But from the perspective of the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty, it was actually okay, and it's outlined already in 1951. In exercise of these rights, Japan desires as a provisional arrangement for its defense that the United States of America should maintain armed forces of its own and about Japan so as to deter armed attack on Japan, and this remains in force today. Um, interestingly, within this security ar arrangement, it says basically that, you know, if Japan is uh, subject to threat from foreign attack, that the U.S. will come to its aid, um, but also... It says um, it will protect Japan against armed attack from without, including assistance given at the express request of the Japanese government to put down large-scale internal riots and disturbances in Japan. This, I think, is often overlooked, but actually the U.S. Uh, military has the power, if it's asked by the Japanese government, to put down, for instance, uh, demonstrations uh, in Japan. So, interesting point to note there. Okay. This brings me then to the conclusion of my talk today. Um, and in conclusion, I just want to emphasize two basic points. Um, first, Japan's World War II defeat and the U.S. occupation had major consequences for the shape of Japan's post-war politics, society, and economics. And second, unresolved inconsistencies continued, continued to cause problems to this day, such as territorial problems uh, in the Northern Territories and the Senkaku Islands, the existence of the emperor system, the presence of U.S. military bases in mainland Japan and Okinawa, Japan's post-war relationship with America in general, and this especially, I think, is important as we consider where uh, things are going to go from this point, because with the decline of the U.S. empire, um, what does this mean for Japan, who is so closely linked to the United States? Is there going to be a shift in the balance of power? Um, are there going to be new regional alliances that are made? Uh, it's, it's hard to tell. These are all debated issues, but I hope that uh, my talk today uh, has helped provide the historical background for understanding some of these more contemporary issues. Um, and uh, in later talks, we're going to move forward and, and talk about post-war Japanese politics and political issues in more detail, but um, I hope that we can keep uh, these things in the back of our mind. Uh, because they are quite important and continue to uh, impact things today. So thank you very much for listening.